When we looked at intervals in the last lesson, we saw that the interval between two notes of the same name, two Cs for example, is called an octave. If you open your Lesson 9 booklet at page 97, you'll find some examples of octaves set out for you. It's no accident that notes which are an octave apart are given the same name. They are, in a very real sense, the same note. Try playing two Cs together. Of course, one of the Cs is higher than the other, but if you play them both at the same time, you can't help hearing how the sounds blend. It's almost as if you've only played one note instead of two. An octave provides the starting and finishing point for what are known as scales. You may already have heard of scales as being a particularly boring sort of musical exercise, but they're really much more important than that. In fact, as you'll see later, scales are fundamental to all music, pop, jazz or classical. Have a look at the scale at the top of page 98, which goes step by step from C to C again, taking in all the white keys on the way. Here it is, ascending, that is, going up the keyboard. And here's the same scale moving down the keyboard or descending. There's nothing to stop the scale continuing up or down the keyboard for another octave, to make a two-octave scale. Now let's try an experiment. Have a listen to the four scales shown at the bottom of page 98. Each of them covers a different octave, C to C, D to D, F to F and G to G, but they all stay on the white keys only. We want you to decide which of these scales sounds easiest on the ear. We're sure your ear will prove a good judge, and that three of the four will sound strange, almost as if you hadn't played the right notes. Listen now. First, the scale C to C. Now, D to D. The scale beginning with F. And finally, the scale from G to G. Did you hear the difference? Hopefully your ear decided that only the first scale from C to C sounded finished and complete. That's because this scale is what's called a major scale. The scale of C major, in fact. So why do the white keys between C and C make a major scale when the same keys played from D to D or from F to F do not? To answer this, we must first of all look at how a major scale is put together. On page 99, you can see that any scale can be divided into seven parts, each part corresponding to a particular note. These parts are called degrees of the scale, and in written music they're numbered using Roman numerals. So, in the examples shown, the scale of C major, C is the first degree, D is the second degree, E is the third degree, and so on, up to C again. The degrees of a scale also have their own names, irrespective of which notes they correspond to. These names are listed for you on page 99. So, in C major, C is the tonic, D the supertonic, E the mediant, and so on, up the scale. But this still doesn't answer our question, what makes a scale major? To find out, turn to page 100 of your booklet. For any scale to be major, it must follow a very precise musical rule. This rule states that all the notes or degrees of the scale must be a whole tone apart, except for...
to the third and fourth and the seventh and eighth degrees, both of which must be only a semitone apart. In the diagram on page 100, you can see that the scale of C major obeys this rule exactly. The distance between E and F, the third and fourth degrees, is a semitone because there's no black key between these notes. The same applies between B and C, the seventh and eighth degrees. And all the other notes are a whole tone apart with black keys in between them. However, the major scale rule isn't obeyed if you start a scale from any other white key. Try playing along the white keys from D, for example, and you'll find you get a semitone between the second and third degrees, and between the sixth and seventh. In other words, you can't play a scale of D major on the white keys alone. As you'll see later, it's perfectly possible to construct a major scale starting from any note on the keyboard. But C major is the only major scale you can play by sticking just to the white keys. Now, after all this theory, let's get down to some exercises. Exercise 89 is designed for you to practice the C major scale. Try each hand separately and play quite slowly before you put both hands together and work up to full speed. Remember too that the smoothness of your playing will depend a lot on how well you've mastered the thumb under technique, which we first explored in lesson six. Here's how the exercise should sound. In exercise 90, the left hand plays the C major scale, while the right hand has a series of notes arranged at intervals of a third in steps up and down the keyboard. E to C, C to E, E to G, F to D, and so on. Exercise 91 in 4-4 four -four time, the crotchet notes written for the left hand play a chord every two beats. In bar 1, for example, the left hand plays a C crotchet on the first beat and E and G on the second, the three notes which together make up the chord of C major. Similarly, on the third beat the left hand plays B and on the fourth it plays F and G, the three notes making up a G7 chord. The second bar is a bit simpler, in that the left hand plays only single crotchets. Even so, the notes are still enough to suggest a chord every two beats. A and C suggest A minor, and E and G suggest E minor. After that, every bar follows the pattern of the first. And to remind you which chords are which, we've printed their names under the bass clef on every first and third beat. Another point to watch out for is the F sharps in bars 7 and 8. Don't forget to play the black keys above the usual F keys when the time comes. Here's exercise 91 played through.
Now we're going to take another look at the black keys. You already know that the black keys can be called sharp and named after the white keys below them. In other words, that C sharp is the black key immediately above C. The word sharp telling us that it's a semitone higher. But it can't have escaped you that as well as having white keys below them, all the black keys have white keys above them too. And this makes it possible to name every black key twice. Once after the white key below it, and again after the white key above it. When a black key is named after the white key above it on the keyboard, it's called flat, to tell us that it's a semitone lower than its name note. As an example, take the black key between F and G. Up to this point, we'd have called it F sharp, the note a semitone higher than F. But now, we can just as easily call it G flat, the note a semitone lower than G. Page 103 of your booklet shows the musical sign for a flat. It looks something like a small letter B. And below it is a diagram showing the alternate names for every black key. From this, you can see that C sharp is the same as D flat, D sharp equals E flat, F sharp, as we've seen, is also G flat, G sharp is the same as A flat, and A sharp equals B flat. In written music, the flat sign works in exactly the same way as the sharp. For example, when you see the flat sign in front of a B on the stave, you know not to play B, but the black key immediately below it, between A and B. And again, just like the sharp sign, the effect of the flat sign lasts a whole bar. Exercises 92 and 93 will give you practice at playing B-flat with the right and left hands. All the Bs in both exercises are flat, so get ready to play the black key between A and B. First, exercise 92 for the right hand. Exercise 93 for the left hand. three new chords in this lesson have a B flat in them. First the chord of B flat major, consisting of the root note B flat plus D and F. With the right hand, and the left. Now G minor, which is made up of B flat, D and the root note G. Here it is with the right hand, and the left. Finally, the chord of A major, C sharp, E, and the root note A. Play it with the right hand, and the left. Exercise 94 uses all these new chords. But before you go any further, there's one small problem to overcome. 
When you play the B flat major and G minor chords with your right hand, the fingering alongside tells you to strike the B flat key with your thumb. But if you keep your hand in its usual position on the keyboard, you'll find that in practice, your thumb just won't stretch that far. Well, if you turn to page 108, you can see how to get round this little difficulty. The illustrations show clearly how it should and shouldn't be done. Don't twist your hand around to get your thumb where you need it. Instead, move your whole hand forwards until the thumb is over the B-flat key. It's really quite easy once you've tried it a couple of times. Now let's hear exercise 94. As usual, we'll move on to play the same sequence of chords in a variety of different rhythms. Here's how the first variation begins. Now the start of the second. And finally, the third. As always, once you've mastered exercise 94 and the variations with your right hand, practice them with the left hand as well. The practice tune for this lesson is a piece called Romeo and Juliet. Let's take a look at the written music before you listen to it played through for you. There's one new note in the piece, the F written in the space below the bottom line of the stave in the bass clef. This is the lowest note you've met so far, so make sure you know where it is on the keyboard before you start. You'll also come across the black keys C sharp and B flat, but you've had plenty of practice with these already, so they shouldn't present any problems. You may wonder why the first four bars of Romeo and Juliet are printed in red. They are, in fact, for the harpsichord part, which you'll hear at the beginning of the piece, so you don't have to play them. Simply follow the bars through as the music plays, so you know when to come in at the start of bar five. Looking through the piece, you can see that the left hand sometimes has to play a mixture of minims and quavers. Let's hear what these sound like together by listening to the left hand part for bars 13 and 14. And by the way, the red numbers at the start of each line of music refer to the number of the first bar in that line to help you find particular bars more quickly. So here are bars 13 and 14. Now look at bar 16. You'll find that to get the rhythm right here, it'll be helpful to count out loud. Listen. One and two and three and four and. From bar 33 onwards, the orchestra has the melody while you play an accompaniment on the keyboard. And if you look a little closer at the music, you can see that the keyboard part is in fact a straightforward sequence of chords. The left hand plays the root notes and the other two notes in each chord appear in the right hand. Here are bars 33 to 36 played for you. You'll also notice that the four bars from bar 37 to the end of the piece are played twice because of the repeat signs. Here's Romeo and Juliet in full.
now the same piece with the backing only. Once you've succeeded in playing Romeo and Juliet as it's written on the stave, you might like to try playing it another way, substituting chords in the left hand for the single minims, crotchets and groups of quavers. To help you, we've printed the name of each chord you need to play under the lines of music, from bar 5, D minor, B flat, C, G and so on. Practice playing through them with your left hand straight away, and if you find you've forgotten some, simply check in the contents lists of your earlier lesson booklets to see where they're covered. When you feel confident of the chords, try adding the right hand part over the top. Don't expect this to be easy. In fact, you'll find it's more than enough to keep you busy until the next lesson. But it's also extremely good practice for the future. So don't be dismayed if you find it hard going at first. <laughs> 